Well, please open your Bible at Matthew's Gospel and chapter 6. Today we're beginning a new series on the Lord's Prayer entitled, Six Things to Ask of God. Now, in any time of crisis, the first duty and the first instinct of God's people is to pray. But what are we to pray? What exactly are we to ask of God? Prayer, I think, is an area where all of us need to grow. I think it's an area in which all who really love the Lord Jesus Christ want to grow. I've met over the years a a, a few folks who would style themselves as experts in evangelism, experts in youth work or in men's ministry. I have never yet met a Christian who thinks of him or herself as an expert in regards to prayer. All of us feel that we need to stand with the disciples and to say, Lord, teach us to pray. And aren't you so glad that Jesus answered that question of the disciples and that we have the answer of Jesus to that question, teach us to pray, uh, right in front of us here in the Scriptures uh, today. What we have here then is the Son of God teaching us how to pray. And who would not want to pull up a chair and to sit down and to hear him as he teaches us today? Now, I've called this series Six Things to Ask of God because there are six petitions in the Lord's Prayer. Three of them relate to God's glory and three of them relate to our good. In relation to God's glory, we ask first that God's name will be honored, then that his kingdom will come, and then that his will should be done. And then in relation to ourselves, we ask that God will provide what we need, that God will forgive our many sins, and that God will deliver us from evil. So, six things Jesus teaches us we should ask of God. And all that we could ever ask, all that we need ever ask, can be included under one of these six petitions. So, the Lord's Prayer is really like a kind of template for praying. It gives us a plan for prayer. It gives us an outline. It gives us a framework. It teaches us how to pray. So, if you were to take, for example, a a, a jotter, and you were to divide a page into six very simple sections, you could call them God's name, God's kingdom, God's will, God's provision, uh, God's forgiveness, and God's deliverance. And on that page, in these six sections, you would have a perfect outline for prayer. Uh, You could use it in two ways when you have it in your jotter. You could first start with the headings and then just fill in under each of them things that you think you ought to pray in relation to each of these six petitions. Or you could do it another way. You could start with what's on your mind. You have a friend who is in some need. They need help and they they need support. So, where does that belong? Well, of course, that's part of what God would provide for them. So, you write that down there. But then you think to yourself, now, wait a minute, what else do I need to pray in regards to this person? I mean, what would it mean for God's name to be honored? Uh, in this situation that this person is facing? What would it mean for God's will to be done in their situation? So, the requests of the Lord's Prayer, they're really like six pegs on which you can hang all of your other prayers. God's The Lord's Prayer is given to us in order to shape our prayers. It is Jesus teaching us how we should pray. 
Now, my aim in this series is that through these six petitions, we will learn better how to pray, that we'll learn how to pray more effectively. And it is for this reason that Jesus has given us the Lord's Prayer. Lord, teach us how to pray. Using the Lord's Prayer as a template in, in this way, it's not something new. Uh, you know, Martin Luther uh, used the Lord's Prayer as a template for his own prayers uh, throughout his entire life. And he commended this practice in a delightful little book called A Simple Way to Pray. Uh, this book was written by Martin Luther for his barber. And I, my imagination just runs into overdrive with this. I, I picture Luther uh, sitting uh, in the chair getting his hair cut. And he leans back in the chair and the barber begins to shave the stubble from his chin. And as he's doing this delicate work, he says to uh, Luther, uh, Pastor Martin, I have a question. How should I go about praying? And I think to myself, well, maybe Luther just said at that point, uh, my friend, please just focus on what you're doing with that razor blade. I'll answer your question, but let me do it later. I'll write you a book entitled A Simple Way to Pray. And that's what Luther did. He wrote this marvelous little book for his barber, uh, telling this man who wanted to know how to pray more effectively, how to do it by using the Lord's Prayer as a template for his own prayers. And uh, Luther says in this book, I do not want you to recite all these words in your prayer. In other words, he's saying, uh, what, uh, this, this prayer is not given simply so that we use it as a repeated recitation. No, Luther says, here's what I want you to do. I want your heart to be stirred and to be moved by the thoughts that are prompted from the Lord's Prayer. In other words, use this as a template. Use each of these six petitions as pegs on which you will hang your prayers, uh, a framework on which you will build the prayers that you offer to God. And this simple way to pray was not simply uh, Luther's idea of, you know, what a barber should do. This is what Luther did himself throughout his entire life. He says this, to this day, I suckle at the Lord's prayer like a child. And as an old man, I eat and drink from it and never get my fill. Well, friends, that describes exactly what I want us to do over these next weeks together. I want us to suckle at the Lord's prayer, to learn from Jesus Christ himself how we should pray. Now, today we look at the first petition of the Lord's prayer, hallowed be your name. We're going to look at the relationship in which this prayer is prayed. We're going to look at the prayer itself and its meaning. We're going to look at the ways in which it is answered. We're going to look at the challenge that it brings. And then we're going to look at the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then at the end, I want us to take time to pray from this prayer together hallowed be your name. Now, let's start here because this is where Jesus begins with the relationship. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven. This is very important. The six petitions of the Lord's Prayer are all addressed to our Father in heaven. In other words, this is a prayer for God's children. 
These are prayers that are to be brought by those who have been reconciled to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a very important reminder for us because by nature, we simply cannot pray this prayer. The Bible makes it very clear that by nature, we are alienated from God and we are dead towards Him. By nature, we are much more concerned about our name than we are about God's name. By nature, we tend to think that life revolves around us, and so if we're left to ourselves, if we were to pray at all, we begin with ourselves and we begin with our needs and we never really get any further. But Jesus came into the world to bring us into an entirely new and different relationship with God. God is His Father. And through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to know God as our Father as well. Jesus brings you into a new relationship with God in which you love Him, you trust Him, you worship Him, you serve Him, and you obey Him. In love for this perfect Father, you will discover a new peace, a new strength, a new hope, and a new joy. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. In Christ, we are adopted into the family of God, and that's why God sends His Spirit into our hearts, the Apostle Paul says, to cry out, Abba, Father. So, the Lord's Prayer has six petitions, and they're all addressed to our Father in heaven. They're all prayed out of this relationship in which, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to God. Father, hallowed be your name. Father, let your kingdom come and your will be done. Father, give us this day our daily bread. Father, forgive our sins, and Father, deliver us from evil. These are the prayers of a Christian disciple. They are not the things that we would ask of God if we were left to ourselves. They are the prayers that Jesus brings us into they are the prayers of God's own children. And so, you want to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Here is where we must begin. We must enter by faith in Jesus that relationship in which we come to know God as our own Father. We come to the Father only through Him. And John makes this very clear in his gospel where he says, to those who received him, that is, received Jesus, to those who believe in his name, God gives the right that they should be his own children. If you want to know God as your own Father, if you want to learn how to pray as Jesus teaches us to pray, you must receive Jesus as the Lord and as the Savior of your life, and you do this by believing in His name. That's where all true prayer begins. Now, what a marvelous thing it is to know the sovereign Lord of the universe as your own Heavenly Father. Dr. Jim Packer has a wonderful little image and phrase on this that has been very helpful to me. I, I just call it, because it sticks in my mind, Packer's Pendulum. And here's what Dr. Packer says. Let your thoughts flow to and fro like an accelerating pendulum taking ever wider swings. He's my Father. He's God in heaven. He's God in heaven. He's my Father. Packer's Pendulum. 
Try and take this in, that when you come before your Father in prayer through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are speaking to the sovereign Lord of the universe, our Father in heaven. When Jesus brings you to know his Father is your Father, you will have such a great desire to pray. You will love the Father from your heart, and because you love him, well, your first desire will be that his name should be honored. That's the relationship. Then let's look together at the prayer itself and what this prayer actually means. Pray then like this, Jesus says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, what exactly are we asking God to do when we pray this prayer? What does it mean, hallowed be your name? Now, I want you to notice that heaven frames the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Did you notice that? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, heaven frames the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, you see, that invites us immediately to think about the scene as it is described to us in the Bible in heaven itself. What is the scene in heaven? Well, angels cry out in heaven right now, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. In fact, the worship in heaven, the exalting of the Father's name in heaven, it never ends. The Scripture says, day and night, they, that is the heavenly creatures, never cease to cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Every creature in heaven, without exception, joins in saying, to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and forever. That's the scene in heaven. Unceasing worship. God's name exalted and God's name adored. Now, what about the scene on earth? Well, listen to how that's described by the prophet Isaiah. God says through Isaiah, continually, all the day, my name is despised. That's the reality on earth, and it could not be more different from the reality right now in heaven. In heaven, God's name worshipped, adored, without ceasing. On earth, His name despised, blasphemed, all day long. And it's into that chasm of the difference between the reality in heaven and the reality on earth that we pray the first petition of the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name. Let your name, O Father, be exalted, worshipped, treasured, and adored on earth as it is in heaven. We are asking when we pray this prayer that God will so move in this world, that God will act in such a way that people around the globe will come to worship Him, to treasure Him, to adore Him, to live for Him on earth as it is in heaven. Father, please bring people to love and worship and trust and adore You. Father, make that true of us in your church. Father, make that true of me in my life today.
Now, notice this is very significant for a person who really comes to know God as Father and truly to love Him. Through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the very first request that Jesus teaches us to pray, He says, begin here, not with yourself and your own needs, but with God the Father and His name and His glory. That's the first petition. Now, that's the prayer. What about the answer? Will this prayer be answered? I guess that's the first question that comes to our minds in regards to any prayer. Will this prayer be answered? And, of course, the answer to that question is yes. Our Lord Jesus Christ did not teach us to pray futile prayers. And you know, one of the wonderful things about using the Lord's Prayer as a template for your prayers, uh, these six petitions as pegs, as it were, on which you can hang your own prayers, one of the wonderful things about doing that is that when you frame your prayers in this way, you can always pray with confidence. You will always be able to know that you are praying in God's will because these are the things that your, your Lord Jesus Christ taught you to pray. Each of these petitions has a wonderful double answer. Each will be answered when the Lord returns, and each has an answer that we can experience in our lives here and now. In other words, for every petition of the Lord's Prayer, there is a now answer and there is a then answer answer. When Christ returns in power and in glory, God's name will be hallowed and honored and glorified and exalted. The Bible says the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. You know, when Jesus Christ returns in power and in glory, this world is going to become the home of righteousness. Never again on this planet will God's name be blasphemed. His name will be honored, loved, treasured, adored on earth as it is in heaven. All of God's people will love Him, worship Him, walk with Him forever and forever. Lord, hasten that day when this prayer will be answered. But how can the prayer be answered here and now? There's not only a then answer, there's also a now answer to this prayer and to all the other petitions in the Lord's Prayer as well. How can this prayer be answered here and now in a world that still despises and even blasphemes God's name? What is God's answer? to a world that blasphemes His name all the day long. Well, God Himself tells us in the prophecy of Isaiah that we looked at earlier, continually all the day God says, my name is despised. There's the awful reality on earth, but here's the answer. Therefore, God says, my people shall know my name. You see, God's answer to a world that despises His name is a people who know His name. Hallowed be your name. That's not a change, a prayer for some kind of a change in God. It's a prayer for a change in us. We're not asking God to make Himself more holy. How could that be? God is holy, holy, holy. He is infinite and perfect and complete in His holiness. He cannot be more holy than He already is. So, when we pray, Father, hallowed be Your name, we are asking God to raise up here on earth people who know Him and who love Him and who treasure Him more than life itself so that in a world that still despises and blasphemes God's holy name, His name may be honored by these people. 
That's how it's answered here and now. Now, friends, that leads us on very quickly then to the challenge that this prayer brings to us and the challenge that we face when we pray it. Praying the Lord's Prayer will change your life. And as we go through this prayer together, we're going to see that the Lord's Prayer is not for the faint-hearted. It searches us out. It plumbs the depths and the motives of our own hearts, even as these petitions get into us and as we get on the inside of them. Lord, I want your name to be hallowed. And so, dear Lord, let my life bring honor to you. Think about this. Who bears God's name in this world? The answer is, we do. Brothers, sisters, we are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture. Peter says very clearly to Christian believers, you are a people for His own possession. You're His people. And you are His people in order that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His marvelous light. You are the ones who will honor God's name on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we saw a few moments ago that God's answer to a world that despises His name is a people who know His name, and here's the challenge that that brings. The Apostle Paul quotes the words of Isaiah that God's name is despised all day long. He takes up that quotation from Isaiah in chapter 52 in Romans chapter 2 and verse 24, for it is written, here's the quote from Isaiah, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. The nations of the world, Paul says, blaspheme the name of God. Now, you would expect him to say, because he's quoting from Isaiah in chapter 52, you would expect him to say, but as Isaiah says, God's answer to a world that blasphemes his name is a people who know his name. But that's not what the Apostle Paul says. Instead, there's a sting in the tail Romans chapter 2 and verse 24, this is what it says, for as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Because of you. Brothers, sisters, we all know what this is like. We've seen the damage that comes to the name and the reputation of our Holy Father, when the world sees someone who bears His name and then acts in a way that is obviously inconsistent with the faith that he or she professes. And you see what the Apostle Paul is saying here? He's saying to people who bear the name of the Lord in the world, you ought to be the answer to the world's blasphemy, and actually you're becoming the cause of it. And if you live in a way that is inconsistent with the name that you bear, then you invite the world to blaspheme God's holy name all the more. I told you this wasn't a prayer for the faint-hearted. It searches us to the very core of our being. Praying this prayer, brother, sister, really will change you, and it really will change me. It will light a fire within you to live in a way that honors your Father in heaven. Father, hallowed be your name. Lord, 
I want your name to be honored. Let me never act or speak in a way that dishonors your holy name. That's the challenge. And now, fifthly, the example. And we'll ask this question each time as we go through the six petitions of the Lord's Prayer. Did Jesus ever pray this prayer himself? And the answer is, yes, he did. He prayed each of the petitions of the Lord's Prayer either for himself or for others. And John records in his gospel how our Lord Jesus prayed this first petition of the Lord's Prayer. It's in John chapter 12 and verse 27. Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Now, you see that prayer of Jesus, Father, glorify your name. That's Jesus praying the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. And I want you to notice this because it's very significant that Jesus prayed the first petition of the Lord's Prayer when his own soul was in trouble. Our Lord faced the prospect of unspeakable suffering. He would be scourged. He would be mocked. He would be crucified. He would bear the curse of all our sin. He would plumb the depths of the darkness of hell itself. And as he thinks about what lies ahead of him, his own soul is troubled. What will he do? Will he say, Father, save me from this hour? No, he's not going to do that. It was for this very hour and for this very purpose that he came into the world. So he says, Father, glorify your name. He prays the first petition of the Lord's Prayer right there and then. Honoring the Father's name was everything to Jesus. Everything to Jesus, even here. Now, friend, there may come a time in your life when you find yourself facing great darkness and even looking into the face of unspeakable evil. And you wonder, how could God's name possibly be honored here? And here's your answer. God's name will be honored when even here you love him and you trust him still. Now, I want you to notice that when Jesus prayed this prayer, he received an immediate answer. The very next verse we read, Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now, notice again here that there is a now and a then answer to this prayer. When Jesus brings the first petition, glorify your name, there's an immediate and there's an ultimate answer to this prayer. I have and I will. I have glorified it. That is, God's name was glorified by what Jesus did in submitting to the cross and God's name is glorified here and now in this world that still despises him by people who love him and people who trust him, even in the darkest place as Jesus did. That's how God's name is honored now. But then the Father says, I will glorify it again. See, God's name was glorified not only by what Jesus did in submitting to the cross, but in what the Father did by raising him from the dead. 
And one day, brothers and sisters, our faith is going to be turned to sight. We are going to see our risen Lord Jesus Christ face to face. And when He comes in power and in glory, darkness will be dispelled and a new day will dawn. Our souls, they're going to be made perfect. When we see Him, we'll be like Him. And our bodies will be transformed. God will be with us. We will be with Him, and we are going to exalt His name forever and forever. Do you know, there's a very good reason why this is the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. And surely, among other reasons, there is this, that when all the other petitions of the Lord's Prayer have been answered, this will still be the first and the greatest desire of all our hearts to all eternity. Think about it. In the presence of Jesus, no one will be saying, give us this day our daily bread, because all will be provided. No one will be saying, Father, forgive us our sins, because sin will be no more. No one will be saying, deliver us from evil, because evil will be banished to the lake of fire forever and forever. No one will be saying, your kingdom come, because the kingdom in all its fullness will be all around us. And no one will be saying, Father, your will be done, because our wills will be one with His will forever and forever, and in that we will find perfect freedom and perfect joy. But God Himself will be honored forever and forever, and that will always be the first and greatest desire of our redeemed and glorified hearts. Will you join with me in praying this prayer? Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in worship today, and we exalt you for who you are and for all that you have done for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. You are love, and in love you gave your Son for us. You are just, and justly you made him our substitute and allowed him to stand in our place. You are sovereign, and by your power you have raised him from the dead. You are gracious, and by your Spirit you drew us to Christ, made us alive in him, and pardoned our many sins. And God, you are faithful. For all the times we have doubted you, and for all the times we have failed you, you have kept us. And Father, you have never, never let us go. Father, we exalt your holy name. Right now, the angels surround you and cry out, holy, 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 and we gladly join them in worship. Father, we grieve that this world does not know you. We grieve that millions can study the order and the beauty of all that you have made and yet give no thanks to you. We grieve because instead of praising the works of your hands, many rage against you as if you were the author of all evil. Father, the world doesn't know you. We grieve that your name is blasphemed all day long across every continent of this world that you have made. How great is the hatred of the human heart against you. And how great is the love that you should love a world like this and send your Son knowing that we would scourge him and spit on him and crucify him. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. We are so thankful that in your grace you have made us your children and that we can call you our Father. We bear your name in the world and we tremble 
to think that any of us would, that anyone would despise you because of what they see in us. Deliver us then from merely calling you Lord and not doing what you command us. Let us be done with living for ourselves and help us to live in a way that honors you. We pray today for friends and loved ones who are under great pressure, who endure great distress and who face great darkness. Grant that your name will be honored as they trust you and love you even in this. And as your Son glorified your name by enduring the cross, so grant them endurance that they may reflect your Son's likeness. Father, we long for your name to be hallowed. Please move and act in this world in such a way that more and more people will treasure you above all else and make that true of us, we pray. We bless you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We often think of his great love for us, but today we are reminded of how much he loves you. And we want to be like him. Not just in this service of worship, but in every hour of every day of our lives. So, Lord, hasten the day when our faith will be sight. And until that day comes, let us be done with exalting ourselves. And let us live for your praise, your honor, your glory alone, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.